everybody. Um, it's really fun to be here at NAB. Uh, it's two years ago, actually, that I approached Sam Messman and told him my idea for this project. And it's kind of unreal that, you know, I had this idea to make a movie about the crazy people who use Final Cut Pro 10 and love it so much. And then I can stand here on stage and tell you, we did it, we made it, it's, and, and I'm happy with the result. It's definitely a movie that people would probably tell me, why would you spend the time and energy on that? That's gonna cost too much money. It's just, you know, there's a lot of reasons to not make a movie. And I, I feel like, <laughs> and I felt like this was an opportunity to actually, you know, tell a story I was passionate about, and I, I figured I could do it. So here's, here's the reasons why I made this documentary, because I'm sure a lot of people wonder, why did you devote two years of your life to this? And the first is, controversy is always really good for, for storytelling. And the release of Final Cut 10 upset a lot of people, and there's a lot of polarizing you know, opinions about it, and, that, and controversy, especially now online with social media, just draws a lot of attention. And the other, the other reason, I think the theme of this documentary is about, about change and how people are affected by it and how they react to it. And I just thought that that was, from an intellectual conversation standpoint, an interesting theme to explore. And of course, I thought that there was a huge gap in education about Final Cut Pro 10. It seemed like there's a lot of misinformation and a lot of people who didn't understand what it was and why they made it. And, and there's a lot of people even telling me that Apple had stopped making it in 2011. And I was sort of tired of hearing that from people when I enjoyed using the software and I was proving time and time again that I could edit with it. And of course, I am very passionate about it, as is a whole community of people that want to get that message out there. And it was an awesome opportunity to network and meet a lot of great people in that network. Everyone was having conversations, like Chris Fenwix has his podcast, and I, was, I enjoyed listening to that, and Sam Messman was putting on these events, and these were people that had a lot of similar thoughts as I did, and, and I wanted to get to know them. And it was really an opportunity to prove to a wider audience, more people outside of my clients and the independent filmmakers in Utah, that I had some skills and abilities, and I could make a movie. And so I had to prove that to myself as well. <laughs> Here's some technical information, just because I think people like knowing little technical facts. Uh, there was over 50 hours of footage in the end that I had to cull and get through. Um, 30 of hours of that was just interviews that I actually shot myself. Um, it was shot primarily on the Blackmagic Cinema camera, because that was the camera I had available to me. Um, but we also shot on a variety of other formats. I rented a C300 Mark II. I uh, had the opportunity to shoot some interviews with the Red Raven, and I got footage, and we'll go over a little bit more about that, but I got footage from the Final Cut community in a variety of formats as well. And here's a few third-party tools that actually were really helpful in my workflow, starting with Lumberjack from the very beginning. Philip helped me a lot with, with uh, getting that going, and Color Finale, because I did this before the release of 10.4. And um, also Color Finale still has the ability to use a Tangent Ripple, which I bought. So um, I'm looking forward to Final Cut implementing some surface control. Uh, Motion VFX actually did some titles for me, and I used a lot of their plugins and, and things. And X to Pro and Pro Tools for audio mixing. And Frame.io is how we um, shared projects back and forth and collaborated. Uh, the first edit um, was 93 minutes. It was actually six separate projects at that time, like Final Cut projects, timelines. And it was just talking heads, and there was like no B-roll. And that was actually a really scary thing, because like, what do I cover all of this with? <laughs> and I ended up um, cutting it down to 77 minutes in the end. And that was actually after shooting more stuff after the rough cut. So that was an interesting process. So collaboration, you know, I'm here at the faster together stage. We're talking about collaboration. How did I collaborate on this film? Well, my two primary collaborators in terms of editorial was Richard Taylor and Alan Seawright. Richard Taylor came on board really early on um, and offered his assistance to be a second pair of eyes and to cut down things. And I met Alan a year ago, actually, at NAB, um, at this same faster together event. 
and we happen to be not live too far from each other in Utah. And so Alan wanted to really put, make me uncomfortable and put me in a position where I had to rethink my movie and not take it for granted the way it was structured. And we're going to get into that a little deeper. So how did I collaborate with people? I'd love to be able to tell you that I had a Luma Forge jellyfish um, that we were able to you know, share stuff with. Uh, I did not. And we didn't, it wouldn't have really worked for this unless um, I'm unaware that there is there a cable that, that can reach from Utah to Maryland, and <laughs> I don't think so, or even, even Salt Lake to Provo, wherever Provo is, that's where Alan's from. So uh, we ended up just duplicating media the old-fashioned way and mailing drives back and forth, and we would share stuff on Frame.io and tried to keep on the same page as much as possible. And then, like I said before, the Final Cut community, I, as I started making notes, this is the B-roll that I need, they really stepped up and provided a lot of shots that I couldn't get myself. And that was one of the exciting things about a project like this, is I could reach out to a community of filmmakers, and they were able to provide me with a variety of things that I would have never been able to go do. Like I said, use Frame.io. So this is a quick timeline of events. Two years ago, like I said, I came up with the initial concept. I started Skyping with Sam. Sam didn't believe I was serious at first. I badgered him for three months. I would send him outlines, and I made a little teaser trailer from found footage on the internet. And, uh, and then finally in August, he's like, OK, you seem like you're really serious about this. So I'll contact the people you want to interview, because I know all of them. And they just are going to be at the Creative Summit. So why don't we interview them all there? Uh, at the same time, over in Europe, Ronnie Cortens uh, got word of what I was doing through Sam and decided to get a few interviews. Um, that Actually, Philip Hodges conducted those interviews in September. So in October, that's really when I started hitting the ground running on this project and actually getting footage. And that was an exciting thing. And then a month later, I went to LA. And actually, pretty quickly after that, um, thanks to powerful organizational tools, and because I had an idea of what I wanted to put together, I had a 93-minute rough cut by the end of 2016 with no B-roll and graphics and a lot of stuff. Um, and through that process, as I was refining the movie and I'd sent stuff to Richard Taylor, uh, there's there actually this crazy event happened where I got an interview with Randy Ubilos. And uh, that was an amazing opportunity. And that really took the project to the next level. And um, I was able to go to NAB last year, and maybe some of you were there, and I showed the first 15 minutes of the film. I released a trailer, and then I ran a Kickstarter. Uh, originally, I asked, because I'd shot everything and I could edit myself, I just asked for $10,000. And the community like really stepped up the plate, and I ended up getting $26,000, which was really overwhelming and showed to me that there was some demand and interest in what I was doing. I got some interviews at Europe, and then I did a um, first kind of pass edit at the Creative Summit, and then I locked the edit uh, early this year, and I was able to release to Kickstarter backers. So that is a brief overview of that. Um, briefly, this is the first outline. Uh, actually, I actually did lots of outlines. This was the culmination of those. And I'd split it out into six different segments. And those became six different projects in Final Cut Pro 10. And the way I was able to organize everything into those projects very quickly, if you look on the left here, this is my library and the smart collections in my library. And um, I created a smart collection for each section of the documentary. And you know, I was able to use keywords from the interviews of whatever they were talking about to feed those smart collections and use ratings to basically cull it down to this is just the stuff that I want to cut together. So before even putting anything in the timeline, I had already taken you know, hours of material and shrunk it down to like you know, about 20 minutes per section. Here's the quick evolution of the project. So I mentioned there's six different sections but they each had their own kind of beginning, middle, and end, and they felt like episodes. And I really wanted to make one big movie. I, and that's where Alan came into play. Richard had helped me trim things down and kind of you know, each of these timelines. But Alan was like, hey, you need to shake things up a little bit. So we started rearranging things. And what came from that process in the end was a 
standard three-act structure. There's a lot more story beats and little things in between, but this is the basics of it. And obviously, the launch of Final Cut Pro X became Act 1, but also sections from change and, and ecosystem and community ended up in Act 1 as well. And then all of this ended up in Act 2. And actually, this is one of the big changes. This video literacy uh, was a section that was originally in Act, like was at the end of the movie. But I realized in order to build up and have one consistent arc, that really the ultimate message of this, this was the idea that everybody can make movies now. And so I realized that I needed to introduce that throughout the project from earlier in the film. And then, of course, video literacy and future made their way into Act 3. And just to give you an idea of how Alan and I did this process, we actually have a behind-the-scenes clip that I'm excited to show you of how we went from these six sections to a more cohesive film. So <laughs> basically, you know, we just uh, gave the script to my daughter, and the transcript printed it out, and she just tore it up. And then we looked at the floor. And we said, oh, OK. And we rethought everything. One of the really important things here is that is kind of what it feels like when you've spent all this time carefully crafting your story, and somebody comes along and takes a bulldozer to it. But it is entirely necessary to making the film better, I feel like. I had become frustrated, and here's actually the actual evolution of the different timelines. Had, as an editor who'd worked for clients and directors and, and f different independent feature films, the people I was frustrated with were the ones who couldn't see their movie from a different perspective and refused to deviate from the script. And the projects that I was the most proud of were the ones that, that we were able to take a look at things from a new perspective. And what I love about the magnetic timeline in that process is it does make it really easy to just try things, to just move something around and not feel like you're going to break your sound effects or your music or, or things like that, and you're going to be able to um, tell a better story. And, and, and this has become easier and easier to do between the organization and the magnetic timeline. I think Final Cut makes this process more approachable, and, and people can start experimenting more and tell better stories. And this movie, at the end of the day, is ultimately about the idea that it is easier than ever to go out and tell your story, that you don't need to wait for a big production budget. You can find ideas like I did, and you can go out and just make a movie. And I'm hoping that you know, it's a product of that message that it itself preaches. It's kind of an internal thing. And I'm just hoping that everybody um, who sees it becomes inspired by that, and we can start seeing more stories from more people as we move into the future at a high quality. So thank you. <laughs>